Now, let's move into the forebrain. The forebrain consists of the diencephalon and the telencephalon. The diencephalon is the most rostral part of the brain stem, shown here in blue. It encloses the third ventricle and has three major derivatives, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The telencephalon is represented by yellow here. It develops chiefly into the cerebrum. Let's begin by looking at the thalamus in the diencephalon. The thalamus is an ovoid mass that happens on each side of the brain. It's perched at the superior end of the brainstem beneath the cerebral hemispheres. It constitutes about four-fifths of the diencephalon, so it is most of the diencephalon. The two thalami, or the two sides, are joined medially by a narrow intermediate mass in about 70% of people. The thalamus is a very complex organ. It's composed of about 23 different nuclei. However, here we'll just consider the five major functional groups. The anterior group, which is part of the limbic system involved in memory and emotion. The medial group, which is emotional output to the prefrontal cortex and awareness of our emotions. The ventral group, which is the somesthetic output to the postcentral gyrus. It allows signals from the cerebellum and basal nuclei to reach the motor areas of the cortex. The lateral group is involved in somesthetic output to association areas of the cortex. It contributes to emotional function of the limbic system. And the posterior group. In the posterior group, we'll see the relay of visual signals to the occipital lobe via the lateral geniculate nucleus and auditory signals to the temporal lobe via the medial geniculate nucleus. Again, there are many, many separate nuclei in each of these regions, but you just need to understand the basic regions. The thalamus is said to be the gateway to the cerebral cortex because nearly all input to the cerebrum passes by way of synapse into the thalamic nuclei first. The thalamus filters the information on its way to the cerebral cortex. It plays a key role in motor control by relaying signals from the cerebellum to the cerebrum and providing feedback loops between the cerebral cortex and the basal nuclei. The thalamus also plays a key role in memory and emotional functions of the limbic system. The limbic system is a complex of structures that includes some cerebral cortex of the temporal and frontal lobes and some of the anterior thalamic nuclei. Now let's move into the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus forms part of the walls and the floor of the third ventricle. It extends anteriorly to the optic chiasm, which is where the optic nerves cross right beneath the brain and extends posteriorly to the paired mammillary bodies that you can see here. Each mammillary body contains three or four mammillary nuclei. These are involved in relaying signals from the limbic system to the thalamus. The infundibulum is the stalk that attaches the pituitary gland to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the major control center of the autonomic nervous system as well as the endocrine system. It plays essential roles in homeostatic regulation of all the body's systems. The hypothalamus, as we'll see later on in the semester, is a very important region of the brain. Let's investigate some of its functions. First of all, hormone secretion. It controls the anterior pituitary by regulating growth, metabolism, reproduction, as well as the stress response. It also has autonomic effects. It's the major integrating center for the autonomic nervous system. Thus, it influences the heart rate, blood pressure, gastrointestinal secretions, as well as motility, it's involved in thermoregulation. The hypothalamic thermostat monitors body temperature constantly. It activates the heat loss center when the body temperature becomes too high and activates the heat promoting center when the temperature becomes too low. Neurons of the hunger and satiety centers 
of the hypothalamus monitor blood glucose and amino acid levels and produce sensations of hunger or satiety, satisfaction. There are also hypothalamic neurons called osmoreceptors that monitor the osmolarity of the blood and stimulate the water-seeking and drinking behavior when the body is dehydrated. Dehydration will also stimulate the hypothalamus to produce ADH, which conserves water, thus reducing urine output. The caudal part of the hypothalamus is part of the reticular formation. It contains nuclei that regulate the rhythm of sleep and walking. Superior to the optic chiasm, the hypothalamus contains a suprachiasmatic nucleus that controls our 24-hour or our circadian rhythm. The mammillary nuclei lie in the pathway of signals traveling from the hippocampus, which is an important memory center in the brain, to the thalamus. Thus, they're very important in memory. The hypothalamic centers are involved in a variety of emotional responses, including anger, aggression, fear, pleasure, and contentment. So you can see, the hypothalamus has a multitude of roles and a number of different relay nuclei. You don't need to know each of these different nuclei, just the general functions of the hypothalamus. Finally, we look at the epithalamus. The epithalamus is a very small mass of tissue. It's composed primarily of the pineal gland, which is an endocrine gland. We'll explore its functions in that chapter. The habenula is also part of the epithalamus. It's a relay from the limbic system to the midbrain. And then there's a thin roof over the third ventricle, which is also part of the epithalamus. So go ahead, right now, pull out a pen and paper and separate out the functions of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. What's the role in general of the thalamus and each of its different regions? And what is the role of the hypothalamus? How is it involved in translating signals from the nervous system to the endocrine system? The cerebrum is derived from the embryonic telencephalon. It's the largest and most conspicuous part of the human brain. It's the cerebrum that allows us to view this lecture, read and comprehend the words, and remember ideas in order to take an exam on this material later. It's the seat of our sensory perception, memory, thought, judgment, and our voluntary motor actions. To review some of the gross anatomy of the cerebrum before we move on, you'll remember that there are two hemispheres divided by a longitudinal fissure. The hemispheres are covered by gyri and sulci. These increase the amount of the cortex, the surface area, that can fit into the cranial cavity. And of course, they increase the surface area for information processing capabilities. Some of the gyri have consistent and predictable anatomy. Some of them will vary from brain to brain and from right hemisphere to left. But there are certain usually prominent sulci that divide each hemisphere into five anatomically and functionally distinct lobes that we'll explore next. The frontal lobe is all about voluntary motor functions. It's here in light blue. It's about motivation, foresight, planning, memory, mood, emotion, social judgment, and aggression. I find the prefrontal region particularly interesting because of its involvement in an emotion and social judgment. Damage to this region of the brain causes people to make bad decisions. The central sulcus divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe forms the uppermost portion of the brain and underlies the parietal bone. It begins at the central sulcus and extends caudally to the parietal occipital sulcus here. It's involved in integrating general sensory information, taste, and some visual processing 
Beyond the parieto-occipital sulcus, we'll find the occipital lobe. This is the primary visual center of the brain. The temporal lobe is a lateral and horizontal lobe here in this greenish color. It's separated from the parietal lobe above it by a deep lateral sulcus. The temporal lobe is associated with hearing, smell, learning, memory, and some aspects of vision and emotion. The insula is the final lobe. It's a small mass of cortex that's deep to the lateral sulcus. If we retract the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe at the lateral sulcus, we get a little view of the insula. It's involved in understanding spoken language, in taste, and sensory information from our visceral receptors. Okay, so why not, while it's fresh, outline or diagram each of the different lobes of the cerebrum and identify the functions. Use the recall method. See what you can do without looking in your notes. Fill in the gaps by looking in your notes. Turn it over, cover it up, begin again. See if you can recall it all. Diagramming helps because you can add color. I suppose you can add color to an outline too. But remember, the color will really help you key in on the information later. Let's move on now to look at how cerebral white matter is arranged. There are three types of tracts that convey information around the cerebral hemisphere and between hemispheres and to other regions of the brain. There are projection tracts. They extend vertically between higher and lower brain and spinal cord centers. They carry information between the cerebrum and the rest of the body. So they might move down into the spinal cord. Commissural tracts cross from one hemisphere to the other cerebral hemisphere. Most of them pass through the corpus callosum, as you can see here. But there are also anterior and posterior commissures. These commissural tracts enable the two sides of the cerebrum to communicate with each other. The third type are association tracts. Association tracts are local. They connect different regions within the same cerebral hemisphere. There are some long association fibers that connect different lobes of a hemisphere to each other, for example, the parietal and occipital lobes, or short association fibers that connect different gyri within a single lobe. Neural integration is carried out in the gray matter of the cerebrum. The cerebral gray matter can be found in three places, either in the cerebral cortex, in the basal nuclei, or in the limb limbic system. We'll begin by looking at the cerebral cortex. It's a layer of gray matter that covers the surface of both cerebral hemispheres. Although it's only about two to three millimeters thick, it constitutes about 40% of the mass of the brain. It contains from 14 to 16 billion neurons. 90% of the cerebral cortex is arranged in six discrete layers called the neocortex. You can see these six different layers over here. The layers are numbered and vary from one part of the cerebrum to another in their relative thickness, their cellular composition, and their synaptic connections. The size of the neurons and the destination of their axons also vary between the layers. Layer 4 is the thickest in sensory regions and layer 5 in the motor regions. All axons that leave the cortex and enter the white matter arise from layers 3, 5, and 6. The earliest type of cortex to appear in vertebrate evolution was one that was either one to five different layers of tissue. This was called the paleocortex. We have paleocortex in regions like the insula and certain places in the temporal lobe. However, the majority is neocortex. Neocortex showed up only about 60 million years ago in vertebrate history. And vertebrates have been around for about 600 million years. So it's neo, it's relatively new to have this extra level of processing capability. There are two principal types of neurons, 
The stellate cells have very spheroid somas with dendrites that project in all sorts of different directions. They receive sensory input and process information on a very local level. The pyramidal cells, however, are very tall and conical with an apex that goes towards the brain surface. They have a thick dendrite with many branches and a small knobby dendritic spines. They include the output neurons of the cerebrum. Those are the ones that leave the cerebrum in layers 3, 5, and 6. The basal nuclei are masses of cerebral gray matter that are buried deep in the white matter, lateral to the thalamus. They receive input from the substantia nigra of the midbrain and the motor areas of the cortex and send signals back and forth to these locations. So they're involved in motor control. There are at least three brain centers that form the basal nuclei, although neuroanatomists disagree on how many centers and how to classify the basal nuclei. But the ones we can count on are the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. Now, this region of the brain gets fairly confusing because of the various different names of naming these nuclei. The putamen and globus pallidus collectively are sometimes called the lentiform nucleus because they form a lens-shaped portion. And then you could look at the putamen and the caudate nucleus collectively and call them the corpus striatum because of their striated appearance. But let's just stick with the caudate nucleus, putamen, and globus pallidus. And the fact that they're involved in motor control. Now, the limbic system is an important center of emotion and learning. Again, it's disagreed on which parts are exactly involved in the limbic system because there are so many possibilities, but it's certainly agreed that the cingulate gyrus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala form the limbic system. The cingulate gyrus is this gyrus that arches over the top of the corpus callosum in the frontal and parietal lobes. The hippocampus can be found in the medial temporal lobe. It's certainly involved in memory. And the amygdala is located just rostrally from the hippocampus. It's involved in emotional processing. The limbic system components are connected through a complex loop of fiber tracks, and it allows for somewhat circular patterns of feedback between the different regions. There are structures that are associated with gratification and aversion. If we stimulate areas of gratification, then we see sensations of pleasure or reward. Whereas if we stimulate some of the aversion centers, we'll see sensations of fear and sorrow. Other components of the limbic system can include the mammillary nuclei and some of the other hyperthalamic nuclei that we looked at earlier, some thalamic nuclei, and parts of the basal nuclei and parts of the frontal cortex. So that really means that many regions of the brain can be involved in emotion and learning. Take a moment here to summarize the different parts of the basal nuclei and limbic system and what the general functions of each system are. We'll explore each of these systems further as we explore the rest of this chapter.